So in this talk, what, what I mean by Kalabi Yao manifold, I'll just write that as CYM. And I'm going to think of that as a smooth projective variety. Uh, X over C uh, with trivial first churn class. So this is what I mean by Kalabiao in my talk. Um, OK. So let me just make sure we're on the same page. So I'll just, uh, so, so definition. So two Kalabiaos are birational to each other if and only if uh, they have uh, sort of isomorphic open dense subsets. So, so this is, uh, you know, two Kalabiao manifolds are birational uh, if there exists co-dimension equal to one sub varieties. Uh, say v and x, and say, uh, well, let's say, uh, let's call these x and x hat. So um, v hat in x hat. So that x minus v is isomorphic to x hat minus v hat. So, um, and then there's a sort of local example of such a birational morphism. Um, so this is a sort of so a local example to think about is the uh, what we call the Atiyah flop. So this is a sort of first thing you think about when you think about birational morphisms of Kolobiaus. So, so you have a P1 inside X and um, P1 inside x hat, and the normal bundle is uh, O minus 1 plus O minus 1, so degree minus 1 line bundle, direct sum with itself. And then what we want to do is, sort of morally what we want to do is uh, remove this P1 and somehow rotate it by 90 degrees here and then glue it back in x hat and then you get this p1 back in x hat so you can sort of think of it as a kind of surgery or something like this so in in general you sort of you know you blow up um so what do you have you have uh o minus one plus o minus one over p1 so you have this space and then you blow up along p1, and then you get O minus 1 box tensor product O minus 1 over p1 cross p1. So when you blow up along this p1, you get an exceptional divisor, which is p1 cross p1, and the normal bundle is this, and then you blow down again. So. So this is the sort of picture of the Atia flop. But uh, you know, as I said, I think of it like a surgery or something. So you're cutting out a tubular neighborhood of P1, and then you're rotating it by 90 degrees and gluing it back. Um, so here's a fact. So these varieties V and v hat um, have a higher co-dimension than usual. So, so we can assume that the co-dimension over C, oops, sorry, apologies. The co-dimension over C of v um, inside x, or v hat, and v hat inside x hat is greater than or equal to 2. So what does this buy us? So 
And this is saying x and x hat are isomorphic away from something of real co-dimension 4. So as a result, we get an identification. So this implies a second cohomology group of x is canonically isomorphic to the second cohomology group of x hat, and similarly with homology. So we have the following question, sort of a general question. So what properties do birational Calabi R manifolds have in common? So I'm going to look at a, this is a kind of a broad, very broad question, and people have answered all kinds of, you know, conject made all kinds of conjectures of, about various sort of objects associated to Calabi R manifolds. But I, I will mainly focus on topology and sort of enumerative um, um, invariants as well. Um, but I won't focus on, you know, there's a whole other story involved, you know, involving derived categories and so on. And I don't know much about that. So there's a theorem. And this is by Batirev in 97. Um, and it says that uh, x and x hat have identical Betty numbers. OK. Which isn't you know, obvious at all. I mean, the only, the only case where it's sort of maybe a bit more obvious would be uh, if you, you know, if x had dimension 3, then, you know, these are, these are identified. And then by Poincare duality, h4 is identified as well. But I don't know, I don't know what to say about h3 or something like this, you know, so, so yeah. So um, uh, there's also a theorem. So uh, by Shu uh, and Yin. Um, oh, I should say one more thing about this. So Batirev identifies the Betty numbers, but he doesn't give a, he doesn't give some morphism of cohomology, you know, homology groups or anything. He just says the Betty numbers are the same. And he uh, he doesn't say anything about this. Is what I'm going to say in a minute. So he says nothing about torsion. He does his characteristic zero. Initially, his pre proof uses something called piadic integration. And then later on, there's this sort of idea by Konsevich called, that uses, which sort of Batirev wrote up, I suppose, in some appendix somewhere, where uh, he proved it without using, you know, without re re go going into sort of characteristic P and, um, and, and instead, you know, doing everything directly in characteristic zero. And, um, but it's somehow everything sort of looks like a, some kind of like Euler characteristic kind of argument somehow. So, you know, that's why you can only identify ranks. And, um, um, now, Xu and Yin, so the story here is that th th this paper, I think, is not out yet. So this is not out yet. So this is just something they sent me. Uh, I asked Cheng Yang Xu a question, and then they, he replied with a paper. So, um, uh, and they, they show that the the uh, the integral cohomology groups are the same as groups, not as rings, just as groups. So the and I think they they sort of somehow just sort of somehow upgrade. Batirev's argument. So they use Batirev's argument, and then they use some other t theorem, um, maybe by someone called Bittner or something. And then somehow, it's quite a short paper. Um, and 
but again, they don't, they don't have a map. So they, they don't have a map, as far as I can tell. Maybe they do, um, and I don't, I, I, but I didn't see it in their paper. So. OK. Um, OK. So maybe before I say any of my uh, uh, So you can ask the question, uh, what about um, uh, the cut product structure? Um, and the answer is, um, it's not the same. There are examples of birational smooth projective varieties with different cut product structures. So um, I, I forgot to put a reference up, but the answer is um, uh, not the same. However, um, we can also look at the um, quantum cut product structure. So we have a conjecture. And this conjecture was by Morrison, I think, in dimension 3, and Rouen in all dimensions. And it says. Um, they're quantum cut products are identical. Well, not, not quite identical, um, sort of after analytic continuation, whatever that means. I mean, morally, they're identical. And I, I, I will um, have a different meaning for the word identical in my, so. Um, so maybe I'll state some previous results. So Li and Ruan proved this in dimension three. And they use a sort of degeneration argument. So, so, so in you know they, they basically prove that you know that they prove it's um, invariant under flops. These are tier flops, and they use some sort of degeneration argument. So you take your Calabi-Yau threefold and you sort of degenerate it, um, sort of somehow along the you sort of somehow stretch out the normal bundle to this p1, and then you sort of see how the gromov witten invariants behave. When you do that, um, yes. So, so any three-dimensional birational transformation can be factored into what? Can I'm guessing they could be factored into simple in, into a T of flops, right, or not? I thought they could. Okay. Uh, I, I would have to find a reference. And, uh, and, and Right. right. So. Yes. So, um, yeah. So, y there is, I think there is a way that people conjecturally think you can identify the cohomologies by you sort of look at the sort of closure of the graph of the birational transform, and then you do sort of this sort of pullback, push forward thing. And I think either that map or some slight modification of this map will give you your identification. And then, um, yeah. and then there's these sort of analytic 
continuous issues as well, which I won't go into here. OK. Um, and then uh, the following people, Iwao, Li, Lin, Ku, Wang. That's a bunch of papers from 2011, 2014. They proved this for something called ordinary flops. Okay, what's an ordinary flop? It's, well, it's a sort of parameterized version of the Atiyah flop, where P1 is replaced by Pn. So it's some just sort of mild generalization of the Atiyah flop, what, what you would have sort of, yeah, sort of naively try and do, I think. OK, so I found this conjecture by Wang, which is the same Wang as this person here. Um, so conjecture by Wang um, in 2002. And he conjectures that sort of after deforming x and x hat sort of simultaneously, um, every birational uh, map is a, a composition of ordinary, fl ordinary flops. This is a kind of strong, very strong statement, I think. But nonetheless, if, you, if this conjecture was true and you combine it with this, then this conjecture would be true. Is that all conjectures of this? Oh, uh, sorry? Is everything here a conjecture? Oh, uh, so this is a conjecture. Okay. Uh, let's see. This is a conjecture. And then this is a theorem by Li and Ruan says this conjecture is true in dimension three. And this is a theorem by these bunch of these people. And they say it's true if your birational transform is a composition of specific birational transforms called ordinary flop. OK. Um, I should also say something about more about this. So um, there are sort of there's, there's, there's qu quantum cohomology, which I'm going to explain in a minute. There's sort of a small version and a big version. The conjectures for this big version, um, but uh, in my talk, and th these people proved it for quantum cohomology, but I'm, gonna, I'm just interested in the small version, so it's much less data. Um, and also, there is some sort of conjecture involving higher genus Gromov-Witten invariants, and some of these people proved it as well for higher genus invariants as well. Um, OK. So what I thought I'd do is introduce small quantum cohomology. So this is this quantum cup product here. So what I'm going to do is, uh, so I have x, which is my kalabi yau manifold. And I have uh, some Kähler form. I choose some Kähler form, omega on x. And I'm going to fix a field k. So 
once I fix the Kalar form, I have a ring. I have the Novikov ring, so some power series ring, or Novikov field, really. I'll write it as, uh, uh, I'll call it omega. Uh, so this is some, it's a set of It's the set of power series like this, where the coefficients are elements of k. This is i in n. And um, these are formal power series, and these exponents are elements of, of h2, this h2 here. this. So t is a formal parameter. Oh, sorry. Yeah, thank you. Omega of ai tends to infinity. So you need this condition that omega of ai tends to infinity, otherwise you don't have multiplication. OK. So how do I define small quantum cohomology? So the, the way I'll define it is as follows. I'll just choose a basis, a homogeneous basis for cohomology of x. So let a1 up to ak be a homogeneous basis for the cohomology of x with coefficients in k. And then we have the associated sort of Poincaré dual basis. So this is the dual basis uh, on h star x k with respect uh, with respect to um, um, Poincaré duality. So the pairing integral over x of a i. Uh, or just, yeah, so this sort of dual, the dual basis with respect to the, the Poincaré pairing. Maybe I'll just say um, the, the Poincaré pairing. OK, so I choose some basis. And my uh, ring is not going to depend on this basis. But. Um, so quantum cohomology, so that's his definition. So quantum cohomology of x with uh, coefficients in this Novikov ring is defined to be, so it's defined as a, as a vector space. It's just the cohomology, or as a, yeah, the cohomology of x with uh, coefficients in this Novikov ring. And, um, and it has some product, which I'll call star. I don't know if I can write a star. And what is this star? So, so where a i star, uh, I can't draw. Uh, I can't. Uh, star, there we go, uh, aj is defined to be a, a sum over all beta in h2 xz um, 
sum from m equals 1 to k. This k is this k here of the number of elements in some parameter space, in some moduli space, m a i a j a k multiplied by, um, oh, uh, there's not enough space. Uh, I'm going to, the inside of this sum is going down here. So number of elements, m a i a j a k times a k, oh, this is not k, this is m. M A M hat T to the beta. Okay. And what is this? So where so where is the is the following. So this set, so this set is, this is the set um, of genus zero um, curves, which I think of as a map U from P1 to X passing through cycles Poincaré dual to a i a j a m. Okay. So I have sort of some cycles a i a j a m a m, and I'm counting sort of genus zero curves that pass through these three cycles like this. OK? And so so this is naturally a ring, and it's associate, associative. It's an associative algebra. OK. OK, so now I want to go to the main theorem. So before I state the main theorem, I just need to introduce some notation. So before I state the main theorem, I want to give some notation. So x and x hat are birational Calabi Yaus. And they have Kähler forms omega and omega hat, respectively. Because um, they're projective varieties, I'm going to assume they're integral Kähler forms. Um, so they lift to some integral cohomology class. And, and then I have. Now, so recall, I have this identification here. So that means I can define a new Novikov ring, which is the intersection of this Novikov ring and the Novikov ring associated to x hat. So I can define lambda k omega omega hat to be the set of power series. So, so I could just write this as omega k lambda k omega intersect 
lambda k omega hat under this identification. So what, it, what is that explicitly? So this is explicitly the set of power series like this. And again, bi is in k. And uh, ai is in h2x with coefficients in z, which is the same as h2x hat with coefficients in z. And I require, well, I need a dependence on omega and omega hat. So I require that the minimum of omega of ai, omega hat of ai tends to infinity. OK. So I have some sort of common Novik offering. And then the main theorem. Is that Oh, uh, uh, well, you see, there's always, you know, if I have two birational Calabi hours, I, you know, I choose some generic curve that evaluates positively with respect to omega and omega hat. You just integrate, you know, because it's sort of. But how do you know there is such a curve? Well, they're projective varieties, so I just choose some sort of, you know. I'm just worried about the example. Well, no. Um, so this flop, as you say, you know, the you know these this flop, this sort of Kähler cones are disjoint. So this flop sort of, as you say, reverse flips p one to minus p one in, in sort of h two. But you know, if you want to know if this ring is non-empty, you know, you just need to find. I don't know, some AI which evaluates, I mean. But in the, in the Teofluck case, it would be empty, right? Because there, there is only this one curve class, and it's reversed. Well, in the Teofluck case, polynomials, of course, of course it's not empty. Yeah, yeah, I could just take polynomials. Yeah. What does that mean? I mean, if, if the sum is finite. Yeah. If the sum is finite, this condition is just irrelevant. It, it just, um, I mean, another way of thinking about it is, uh, is there another way of thinking about it? That's good. So, you know, the Novikov ring is, you know, you have this sort of omega, which is sort of like a, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if there's another good way of thinking about it, but um, yeah, it's not empty. As you say, I can just take polynomials. I can just take, yeah. A smaller ring corresponds to a larger space, right? Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That. Yeah. In terms of spec, a smaller ring. Yeah. Yeah. Corresponds to a larger space. Yeah. Yeah. The Good. Ring is the space. Yes. Okay. So here's the theorem. So this is what I'm going to spend the rest of the talk explaining. So there exists a graded lambda omega omega hat k algebra z and algebra isomorphisms as follows. So z tensor over this ring lambda omega k isomorphic to quantum cohomology of x and z tensor over this ring um, isomorphic to quantum cohomology of x hat. So this is what I mean by the quantum cohomology rings being isomorphic. There's some sort of algebra defined over a smaller ring 
so that when I tensor over the relevant Novikov field, I get my quantum cohomology algebra back. Any questions? Uh, so, I mean, as a, so z, uh, let me see. So, uh, actually, I don't know much about Z. Um, I know very little about Z, um, but I suppose it's fine as a, you know, this, um, you know, if I took the, uh, like say field of fractions of this, and I tensor z with the field of fractions of this, then I get something finite dimensional. Um, but I'm not sure there might be some horrible infinite dimensional thing otherwise, which I hope doesn't exist, but it might theoretically. OK. So also as a corollary of this, I get that um, the uh, integer Cohomology groups are the same as well, and you know, I suppose I proved this at the same time as Zhu and uh, Yin, but their paper is ninety pages shorter. So, okay. So how do I prove this? So I use um, a kind of version of symplectic cohomology um, in order to uh, define symplectic cohomology. I have to talk about Hamiltonian flow cohomology. Um, I'm going to sort of I know lots of people know about all this stuff anyway, but I'm going to say it. I'm going to define it anyway just to fix notation for for experts and for non-experts. Um, you know, it's a they can learn about Hamiltonian Fleur cohomology. OK, so I'm going to just fix a symplectic manifold uh, with uh, C1 equals 0. So you should think of m omega as either x or x hat. And on this, Hamil on this symplectic manifold, I have a Hamiltonian. So we let h be a Hamiltonian on m. So Hamiltonian flow homology is a uh, you know, homology of a chain complex. And the chain complex is freely generated by, well, morally, by one periodic orbits of the Hamiltonian. However, in my definition, I want to um, uh, choose orbits with, with a capping. So, so, um, so a capped one periodic orbit of H is a one periodic orbit with a choice of cycle whose boundary is that orbit. So is a one periodic orbit of H together with a cycle whose boundary is this orbit. So you should think of an orbit gamma with some choice of, say, surface bounding this orbit. And then it's really an equivalence class of surfaces where any two are equivalent if they're homologous. Um, I, 
in my paper, I kind of really rely on the fact that I have, you know, there's a sort of more abstract way you could define Hamiltonian flow homology, but somehow it's more convenient to do it this way for me. So I have an act, uh, I have a, what we call an action of this orbit. So I write that as A of gamma. This is defined to be the integral over this surface sigma of uh, gamma star omega plus the integral of um, over the boundary of sigma of uh, gamma star h. So Hamiltonian flow homology is Morse homology of this function here, roughly. So I'm going to fix two real numbers. So let a minus a plus be real numbers. And then I'm going to define the following group. So, so definition. So Fleur cohomology a minus a plus of h uh, is defined as follows. So is, so let's say, is the homology of um, a chain complex uh, freely. Um, uh, so this is with coefficients in k. I'll ignore this coefficients in k usually. So um, maybe I'll just fix k and I'll just leave this out. So um, generated as a k vector space by uh, capped one periodic orbits gamma whose action is in between a and b. So a of gamma is in this interval a plus a minus. And then there's a differential. Um, let's put this on this board. So there's a differential. Um, so I won't say much about this. This is a, a matrix with respect to this base, base, basis. Uh, with uh, um, whose um, say gamma minus gamma plus entry is the number of cylinders like this, joining gamma minus and gamma plus, satisfying some PDE. And I won't say what that PDE is, because it's not very helpful anyway. And you know, this cylinder is sort of compatible with the capping. So there's some capping here. And then this capping of this orbit is this capping here. So somehow the comp cappings are compatible. OK, so that's Hamiltonian Fleur cohomology. Um, OK, so what's symplectic com So now I'm going to talk about symplectic cohomology. Um, there's a lot of people I can uh, credit for this. So there's people like Helmut Hofer and Fleur and um, a bunch of other people. Um, but this is a sort of slightly different version of symplectic cohomology um, that I'm interested in. So um, 
Joel Groman, Sarah Venkatesh, and Umut Farrell Gunas. But I'm sure other people earlier have thought about this kind of thing before. Um, but I'm, I'll credit these people, and I should really credit Hofer and Fleur and so on as well. Um, so, so what is this group? So we have a definition. So we let k inside our symplectic manifold M be uh, compact, you know, be closed. I'm going to assume M is um, M is a closed symplectic manifold. So I have a closed subset of M. And then I define symplectic cohomology as follows. So symplectic cohomology of K inside M is defined as follows. Um, so what do I have? I take, so I'm going to start over here. So I take a direct limit over all Hamiltonians H so that H restricted to K is strictly left negative. So this is a Hamiltonian. H, so that H restricted to K is negative. And I take the direct limit of HF star H over some interval, A minus A plus, like I did here. And now I have this A minus and A plus, so what do I do with those? So I take an inverse limit over A plus and a direct limit over A minus. And I suppose officially I should do this at the chain level and then take homology, but I'll, I'll just say it like this. Um, actually, for the k's I'm interested in, they're the same. OK, so that's symplectic cohomology. Um, so I, th I think Umut told me are these three definition, these, these, there's, a, there's three definitions of symplectic cohomology, and they're all slightly different. And I'm not sure. I think they might give different results. Um, so yeah, um, that's just a side note. OK. Uh, Venkatesh version, roughly, yeah. I think. OK, so this satisfies some properties. So I'm going to list. How many properties am I going to list? It's, um, oh, I've got 12 minutes. OK, I'm going to try and list six properties. And then we put all the properties together, and we prove our theorem. OK? So properties. So property one. So symplectic cohomology of k inside m is a lambda omega k algebra. And it has a product. It involves counting pairs of pants. Property two, if k1 is contained inside k2, there exists a lambda omega k algebra morphism um, sh star k2 inside m mapping to sh star k1 inside m. This is called a transfer map. or a continuation map. Um, property three. So this is where we connect with quantum cohomology. So symplectic cohomology of M inside M is isomorphic to quantum cohomology 
of m with coefficients in lambda omega k. Um, okay. On this board. Okay, property four. So before I state property four, I need a definition. So I need a definition of something called stable displaceability. So a subset A inside M is stably displaceable uh, if there exists a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism um, phi from m cross t star s1 to m cross T star S1, where this is the standard symplectic form on T star S1, uh, so that phi of A cross S1 intersect A cross S1 is the empty set. Okay. So before I state property four, I have this preliminary, preliminary definition. The great thing about stable, what I like about stable displaceability is A could be a subset which isn't, dis dis you know, you can't displace it for topological reasons. However, if you cross with S1, it's topologically displaceable. So that's a nice, sort of nice thing I like about this. So what's the property? So property four. So if M minus K is stably displaceable, uh, then the transfer map Uh, SH star M inside M to SH star K inside M is an isomorphism. This uses ideas by, I think, by um, Victor Ginsburg, I think, sort of. Um, but, you know, Paul Seidel's student, Umut, has some version of this theorem as well. I think he can prove the same theorem. I think. I think he told me that. So, um. OK. Uh. OK, now we need some more technical. So we have two more properties to state. Actually, maybe I'm going, to, I'm going to state them on the bigger board because that board's too small. Okay. Um, so, property five. Um, again, I need a preliminary definition before I state the main property. Uh, so uh, this is a sort of technical definition, but it's kind of important. It's actually important. This is really where I use the C1 equals 0, because I haven't used the kalabi yau property in any sort of non-trivial way yet. So this is where I start using the kalabi yau property. Um, so an um, index bounded uh, Louisville domain D inside M is, well, it's a Louisville subdomain with some index property on, on its ray orbits. So, um, okay, so let's just, I'm just going to copy what I've written out. So I'm going to just define Louisville domain really quickly. Um, and then, so it's a co-dimension zero submanifold with boundary 
d um, with a one form uh, theta so that d theta is omega restricted to d and its omega joule x theta points outwards along the boundary of d um, and the contact form theta restricted to the boundary of d has finitely many rave orbits uh, of each index. But the indices could go to plus or, to plus or negative infinity? Yes. Actually, in my case, I think they go to negative infinity. OK, and then what's property 5? OK, so what's property 5? So if uh, this isn't, OK, d0 inside d1 inside m are index bounded Louisville subdomains. And the sort of cobordism between d1 and d d0, so this is d1 minus d0, is a trivial Louisville cobordism. So I won't define that. So this is a trivial Louisville cobordism. So um, you know you should think of some nice family of index bounded Louisville domains from d0 to d1. Um, so then the transfer map is um, an isomorphism. So then symplectic cohomology d1 inside m to symplectic cohomology of d0 inside m is an isomorphism. OK, so that's probably 5. And then, OK, one more property. Right. So, so yeah. So, you know, Sarah Venkatesh has this paper where, you know, if, if you don't have this index bounded assumption, uh, you can have a map which is, say, trivial from the larger one to the, the, the. So, there's some sort of quantitative property. But, you know, somehow, because I'm having f only finitely many Rabe orbits of each index, you know, I can work sort of one index at a time. So, I only have to worry about somehow, you know, Sarah's issue is she has this sort of infinite sum going off to infinity, sort of longer and longer Rabe orbits. And, and I don't have that ish, issue here, because I had this index bounded assumption. OK. OK, probably 6, I'm afraid, is the most technical one. And I'm afraid I can't state it precisely. Um, actually, I'm going to erase. Uh, I don't really want to erase those properties. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to. Try and fit it on here, I suppose. Okay, so six. Um, oh, actually, maybe I, I want to say something about this stably displaceability thing. So, um, so a, a fun exercise. I can tell you the answer at the end. Is um, any codement positive co-dimension symplectic submanifold of M is stably displaceable. Um, OK. So this last property allows us to sort of change the Novikov parameters. And it's a little bit complicated. And as I said, I can't state everything. So suppose I have a subset. So this is a, is a union. of co-dimension, real co-dimension, greater than or equal to four submanifolds. So you should think of some you know, co-dimension two or higher complex subvariety of x or something like this. Um, and let j be an omega compatible 
almost complex structure. Um, and omega hat, say an omega, a, a, a J tame um, symplectic form on M minus V. So I should think of this as the symplectic form on the birational thing. Uh, let D inside M minus V uh, be an index bounded Louisville subdomain. Um, so then, symplectic homology of D inside M can be defined over this intersection of Novik offerings, lambda omega, omega hat k, um, using Hamiltonians, uh, which are identically constant outside a neighborhood of D, which are constant. Um, a neighborhood of D. And these constant orbits do not contribute to the Fleur chain complex. So what I have is a sort of second filtration which somehow gets rid of these constant orbits. Um, so these constant orbits do not contribute to uh, chain complex. So I, I can really have this Hamiltonian identically constant. And the Fleur trajectories you know, are, sort of, are actually holomorphic there. And they don't, you know, I can prove they don't break there or something like horrible like that. Um, so you should somehow, morally, you should think of somehow D is like the complement of something like an effective ample divisor. And somehow this alternative filtration used to exclude these orbits is somehow the some filtration involving intersection numbers of the flow trajectories with, with this effective ample divisor. OK. Um, OK. Oh, I, I'm, I'm sort of done now. It's, it's three past five. I should say something about the proof of the theorem. So, um, so, so how, how, how does the proof of the theorem, the main theorem, work? So, so, so first of all, it, what you do is you choose a common affine subvariety. So this is a common affine subvariety. And you sort of choose a, um, so after modifying, so after modifying, uh, say, omega and omega hat slightly, um, we can assume there are sort of Louisville, index bounded Louisville subdomains with the sort of properties um, I stated here. So there exists um, index bounded Louisville subdomains uh, row inside X and D1 inside, well, they're inside A. So D0 inside D1 inside A. And um, omega is equal to omega hat near d0 and uh, d1 minus d0 is trivial trivial cobordism um, in in x hat omega hat and the complement of d1 in x hat 
is stably displaceable, and the complement of d0 in x is stably displaceable. Maybe, yeah. Um, yeah. So, the x minus d x hat minus d1 is stably displaceable, and uh, x minus d0 is stably displaceable. So now you just use all these properties and combine it with this geometry, and then you're done. Um, maybe I'll say one thing. How, how do I show this stable displaceability? So the complement of D is D1 or D0 is a small neighborhood of a sub-variety of X and X hat. And sub-varieties of Kähler manifolds are sta stably displaceable. So um, I'll stop there. <laughs> okay.